them here. TSM ran two trees yesterday with the Ivern in the jungle and the Maokai in the top lane. So yeah, you expect them to ban away those three, but LeBlanc would be the one that you would want to leave up if you have a counter for it, and you also think that uh, Ryu isn't all the way up there in that tier list. Pretty bold, perhaps, but TSM will be the bans here from Phoenix 1, taking both the Maokai and Ivern is actually the last ban there. TSM maybe mulling over this last ban. Like you said, they could leave it open, but instead decide that it's just safe. It's a banner away. So LeBlanc taken there. What's left open for P1's first pick? Jungler's immediately yeah. leaping out. Kha'Zix, Varus, the two that you would think is first pick worthy here. The hover of the Gangplank. Gangplank is also the champion that Zig played in game three against TSM, and he had a fantastic showing there, showing, you know, Hotzer, he can take him down in the top lane with that. It's one of those things where Zig is such a stable, consistent player. You don't really associate him with carry champions, but it's not like he's incapable of doing it. Almost every top laner has at least a couple of picks that they can bring out and shine on. But first pick, Kha'Zix here, makes sense here for Inori. But actually, Jace over to Haunter, speaking of those more carry-oriented top laners. Yeah, carry-oriented for him in that top lane. The Jace, interesting because they usually run a tank top. This means that Svenskaren, if he is going to lock in the Graves, be unusual. Thank you. I expect him to go for something like the Jin or the Varus. It's the gin that he locks in. Actually, Varus dropping through here. That's been considered sort of the first pick AD carry now that the lethality changes have moved through. And even last week before those changes, Varus and Jin were kind of getting their nod over Ash. That's true. But you got to think about the supports that are also left up. Because of Phoenix 1's ban, Zyra on the table, Malzahar also on the table. Both great synergy alongside the Jin, And the Corky picked up here. So picking a very stable mid laner. It's Bjergsen. It gives him an opportunity to possibly play an, play an assassin or go with something like a Cassiopeia into it. I like that because it does feel like, you know, Rise LeBlanc, they're the obvious strong mid laners that often get banned away. Corky, to me, feels like one of the best and also one of the safest blind picks. But I agree that he does open up space for the enemy mid laner. Varus going to be picked here for Arrow. That's no surprise at all to TSM. Arrow's taken it almost every opportunity. Curious to see Turtle take Jin instead of it. But it's kind of curious to see what TSM want to do with this final pick here, because mm -hmm. they might want to pick a jungler. That Rek'Sai is kind of the obvious one, but support's also available. So TSM kind of in a funny spot here. Yeah, if you don't pick your jungler here, you drop down and may have to play something that doesn't synergize well with the team composition. So the Rek'Sai, like you said, one of the tanks that's left I think I have to. Because you have the carry top laner. That's the thing. When you have the carry top laner, you typically want to have the Rek'Sai alongside it or a tank with Ivern. Uh, but J Jace, we have seen flex to the mid lane yeah. even just yesterday. I mean, that's the other thing. If you, they don't pick Rek'Sai, maybe they're saying, okay, we can take Lee if he drops through the draft. So I think this pick does signal that it's very likely to be a carry top laner, win the Jace there for Haunter. But we'll see what happens in the next phase of picks as we are into ban phase number two. Tom Kench actually banned by TSM, which has been picking up some popularity. There's a Syndra ban from Phoenix 1. So it looks like Bjergsen not taking his mid laner early. Going to cost him a couple bans here as Phoenix 1 are going to try and target out champions that will be good into Ryu, but Bjergsen should have plenty left open as Miss Fortune actually banned away, maybe signaling that Zyra pick yep. that you mentioned, or even the Malzahar pick as well. Yeah, that's the thing, is now as Phoenix 1, I don't think you actually ban Malzahar or Zyra unless you really consider one of those uh, a much bigger threat than the others, because the Jin synergizing with the Malzahar is just as scary. If you want one for yourself, or they could ban one if they're comfortable playing the Nami alongside the Varus like before. And that's really interesting that they ban away the Gangplank because the top lane is what you would suppose is already locked in here. Yeah. And it would be an all physical damage composition if they did go with the Gangplank for TSM. I mean, kind of interesting, maybe expecting a switch as there's the Zyra pickup for TSM. So deciding that they want uh, what they think is the better of the two supports. Yep. I think that generally follows conventional yeah, logic. Zyra's been so strong. Zyra is so strong. And even into Malzahar, she is considered quite strong as well. So it doesn't matter if you uh, pick it up that the enemy team would be able to pick the Zyra into it. But that's what I would assume is the Nami, which Adrian has been loving. He's been playing it alongside the Varus and just considered yep. a great disengage champion as well as somebody who can sustain you for the lane. <laughs> Adrian having some fun, Flash of the Thresh. We'll see what they want to do with their last pick here. It seems like top lane is missing. And they have a decent idea of what's happening. One of the nice features of this draft from TSM is they are technically hiding their last solo lane pick here, so Phoenix 1 don't have complete information. They have a very good idea that Jace is probably top lane, but they'll take Shang, which again, another very safe tank, particularly with Maokai banned away. Teams are trending more towards Shen than something like the Nautilus. It's so interesting because Zig is 
honestly been a little bit of an innovator who's been overlooked because every time there's something that was being played in the other region or even before sometimes he is saying you know that's already a good champion when i have conversations with him he's like yeah shen is really good i don't know why people are playing it you think back to last split he was the first north american top laner to play nar when europe was playing it and then people didn't get on that train until near the end of the split so it's really interesting we'll see what he has does here in the top lane but i know that this matchup Shen takes a beating. Eventually, though, the W helps out against the Jace a ton. Yeah, well, last week, Cassiopeia for Bjergsen, so a pretty standard mid lane matchup. Two exhausts by the looks of things, which makes sense given the consistent and all burst damage from both of these champions. So they should be comfortable there in that matchup. Ryu is not going to try and outplay with something like a cleanse, at least this time around. But I think the top lane matchup is one to talk about here. We're starting to see a lot of Jace specifically be the big top lane pick. And almost always, there's no other carry people want to play into it just yet, so they are taking more of these tanks. Yep. And again, that seems like an interesting trade-off, because you feel like as a team you'd want one or the other. But like you said, Jace favored early, but the tanks tend to scale more towards the mid to late game and uh, give you team fight ability where you get more split pushing ability with the Jace. Yeah, Jace is a uh, is kind of a stopper. When somebody picks Jace, the other team, if they play a top laner that's a carry as well, Jace has the range, starves out most top laners. Jace, just by picking the champion, has almost like a passive that's, hey, he will be about 30 CS up come about you know 15 minutes. So if you pick a carry top laner that's gold reliant, Jace starves them a bit, delays when they come online. Tanks, doesn't matter, but they still take that beating. Yep, certainly will. So we'll see how the early game works out here as Phoenix 1 and TSM are gearing up for game number one. Pretty standard stuff in the draft. I think a lot of what we expected here. Anori, though, definitely going to be eyes on him for the Kha'Zix. We'll see if Svens Garen can keep him down. In the top side, we're going to see if Zig can kind of take the expected beating from Hwansa. Bottom lane's likely going to be a wash, or maybe Ari and Adrian can get something done. But a matchup that we do want to look at, Bjergsen vs. Ryu, feels very close. So that's that's my favorite thing about this, yeah. going into game one. Bjergsen and Ryu have champions they can both make plays on, both carry on, and both win lane on. So we're going to have eyes on them. And you see, speaking of Bjergsen, he has the cleanse now. So the double exhaust coming through for P1 uh, may not be as effective since it would remove the summoner spell and completely negate it. And Bjergsen also making sure he doesn't get caught by things like the Shen, as well as the chain of corruption from Arrow. And the bottom lane, as you were talking about, could be a little bit favored towards the double A combo of Arrow and Adrian. They have sustain, which is one of the weaknesses of Zyra because she's more pokey as opposed to an all in. Uh, so they could have a bit of an advantage there if they're able to play it right. Oops. And yeah, Fervor Rek'Sai. We're seeing way more of that since the first boss's nerfs. Uh, but that's a little unusual considering that he is the sole tank of the team. Well, again, trying to get some stuff done early. Svenskeren loves to live in the enemy jungle as Ryu's going to cancel that recall. Nice ward. Svenskeren smartly walks away, but Minions might have to start with reduced jungle health. He's going to try and recall once again and get back to his camp, but be a little tricky to start things off. Rexay though, tends to be safe on those early clears, despite the changes to the jungle. Yeah. But, I mean, Svenskeren, I assume he will start on the top side still. He has enough time. If you back by one minute and 20 seconds, you usually get there okay, but... Or sorry, if your back completes by then, you get out of base, but... no, oh, no. Nope. Start it up for him, and Hansor will bring it towards him. Yeah. Well, it won't again. be too much worse for wear. Oh, Svenskeren actually uses the Blast Cone for a bit of extra movement efficiency. And this Hansor going to help out. We've seen quite a number of... Uh, strong oh, wow. leashes. Turtle got chunked. Chunked at the beginning of the game. It's a bit strange, given that we normally expect the Zyra plants to be doing work at level one, but, you know, you know, it is consumable. So we do have that very popularized longsword three pot start for both AD carries, so he'll be able to eat some of that sustain. But like you mentioned, it feels like Adrian once again going yeah. back to things he really loves, but seemed very effective in a poke heavy bot lane meta. He's being very aggressive, and even there, Arrow got two auto attacks off the one of Wild Turtle, so the trading is actually just way better for Phoenix 1 right now. And Biofrost, you saw previously, he actually queued and missed the minion wave, which stopped a little bit of the push. He's using it for harass. Zig, yeah, he, like we said, you kind of have to just take the beating in the top lane, but if you do something like that and get chunked out, you definitely hurt your chances of actually being uh, relevant a little bit earlier on. Yeah, Jace, particularly good champion in those early stages of the game. So we'll, see, we'll keep track on that matchup. And we saw that he had Thunderlords. And one of the interesting things about the Lethality buff was the Precision Mastery in the middle of the Cunning Tree right before Thunderlords. Uh, because we buffed Lethality by 20% at level 1, Jace actually has two more armor penetration at level 1 than he did before. So that is something that, you know, people are like, oh, Jace is really good. He's even better 
even if you don't build any lethality items, just because the mastery helps you punish in the early game, which was his goal in the first place. Yep, you can see 10 CS up already. Lane looking good there for Hansa. Turtle and Arrow still trading blows. Thunderlord's procs from the plant onto Adrian, but you can see that looks a little better right now for Arrow, who still hasn't used that first biscuit, so does have a consumable up. He's got Adrian in the back pocket as well to try and help heal him up. So again, that looks to be helping out nicely, and so far so good on an early CS lead that Turtle and Biofrost are going to have to make sure they play the lane carefully, because if they have any attention as well from junglers, things will get real messy down here. Yeah, very messy. They also have Inori playing to the side right now. They'll probably back Ryu taking a lot of damage. Yeah, Cassiopeia is just so abusive in the early game. She'll run out of mana and possibly back and try to pick up another Dorns or a tier uh, and start scaling. Looks like Tien Alpha BX and he's actually going to go back. Just get the wave push in first. There's that yep. T you expected. And a control ward as well. So Bjergsen going to keep the vision up nice and early. Once again, Adrian snared up, but Turtle's just firing away. And Arrow knows he can win these trades. Biofrost doesn't have a root, so Arrow not feeling the pain too much there. And now Turtle's officially out of consumables. And Arrow still has two left, if I'm reading those tiny numbers correctly. So mm -hmm. He has two left. Doesn't have to spend them, like you said, because he has the Nami healing him up and sustaining him. Hanser. Taking a lot of damage here. Ooh. Minion aggro as well. Yeah, that hurt a lot. That cannon creep is working overtime. Yeah, but Sven Skarin is up on this side of the map. Uh, and when you have a Jace top lane, he's just providing vision for him. He's providing cover. You get the Scuttle Crab, you ward for him, you make sure that you are at least taking care of that lane. Because uh, if you don't, he gets ganked. The Jace is completely behind because he wants to play that far up. The fact that the Jace is all the way up there means that he's just a gankable lane and Inori could make his way and punish. And we have seen that when you can get some sort of leverage, in these carry versus tank top lane matchups, you can potentially blow their flash, revisit it as a jungler, and then look to tip the matchup in your favor. It's not easy, but good coverage there from TSM to make sure Haunter is okay. Yeah, and I will say though that Haunter is actually not destroying this matchup in the way that you would expect. He's only three CS up, three CS up at the moment, and he was forced to back, ran out of mana, a little bit down in levels, and I believe the wave is actually pushing towards uh, Zig in the top lane. Ah, okay, let's slowly push back the other way. So Hanser does have some CS to pick up here, but Zig will be level 6 a little bit sooner. Yeah, Hanser again. Both top laners actually going to blow their teleport, so everyone back to safety. Double Doran's longsword there for Hanser, refillable control ward, and pretty much a lot of early armor and health for Zig. He knows exactly what he has to do in this matchup, which is just keep getting shot and hope he lives through it. Yeah, and, and Zig loves Chase. It's a, it's a champion that he was playing before pretty much anybody else was in the top lane. Uh, he's been playing it for years. Even when he was trying out for Team Liquid, he's like, his pocket Jace is just so good. Uh, so he knows how to play against this champion. And he knows the timings of the abilities. So you saw when he used his dodge zone there, and he was able to oh, make sure. He, I heard the W from Jace. All right, time to dodge. Make sure he doesn't get anything from it. Certainly want to line those ones up correctly. As it looks like Inori is going for a bit of an adventure into the enemy jungle. Usually Sven Skarin is the one we expect to see getting work done there. As Arrow and Adrian is going to push this lane in. It seems like TSM kind of playing on the back foot push up towards this turret. Hanami working out once again as that strong lane support. Zenori is done with his journey into the enemy jungle. Monster again onto Zig, but Curious Refuge. Gonna keep Zig safe. He's got plenty of charges on the potion, so should be okay as the wave pushes back towards him. Monster has been able to wrestle back that CS lead, but Zig will now start playing catch up with this wave. And the level six coming through as well. And the ward control, just looking across the map, control wards are very sparse right now. They've been cleared out, except for that one in the top lane that was put down, I believe, by Svenskeren to help out rather early on by Svenskeren or Hotster to cover the Jace, make sure there aren't any flank routes. I got the tribal sword there. So again, kind of early game plan going well for TSM. Bjergsen's actually up CS as well. Looking at 10 versus Ryu, who's about to get his blue buff. That'll help tremendously in the matchup, but Ryu hasn't got the early back, has got his back in yet. I mean, Bjergsen only got a tier and a control ward, so he didn't get a huge spike off it either, but Ryu has been farming up. He's going to catch this wave and then probably look to recall and get a buy-in. Otherwise, he might get strong on by Bjergsen, who was thinking about going back, but instead going to stay around to catch his next wave. Yeah, and Ryu actually hasn't been punished too much. He used two, and yeah, this is actually tricky. Wow, okay. That was a good reaction there, making sure that he dodged it. Ryu was trying to fast shove the wave, which is what you're supposed to do, because if you back there, then you know, he, Bjergsen can match backs, or he shoves it up and gets you a, a worse recall and you lose CS. But hold on, top lane. Yeah, it looks like something's happening here. Zig, big beating. Yep, and now he's just going to play defensive anyway. I don't... So Skarin's kind of wasting his time up here unless he's really going to force something. Uh, because of the fact that Hauntzer actually chunked him out, gave Zig a... 
uh, a sense of danger just because of his low HP in the first place. This is a tricky oh, under oh, good taunt. Hansa eating two shots for his trouble. Seems like he's just got caught a little too far forward on the Jace and taunted twice now that's led to some unfavorable trades. Yeah, that's actually... Zig is playing this really well. He's getting the Jace lower and he's making sure that, you know, he's, you, he's damaging his mana in a way because you'll use the energy to put down the Spirit's Refuge in the dodge zone when the Jace spent mana to actually deal damage. So he's actually doing zero damage for the mana that he spent, and you're just spending energy. So that's the big thing there, is Zig is actually slowly attacking his mana. And since Jaces don't build tier anymore, it definitely helps out. We can see Phage now for Haunter has gone back for a few extra items at mid lane. Some things could be brewing here. Blue buffs up for both of them now. Ryu is going to drop off a little earlier, but Phage Sheen up for him, looking towards that Trinity Force. And the Lost Chapter, plus a Null Magic Mantle early for Bjerg, which means he's also got kind of his first strong components. So look for Ryu to maybe get out of the lane and influence something else with the package while he's got it for about a minute longer. Yeah, and he's playing up, even though he doesn't have any control of the river on left or right side, because he has the package and he has a way to escape if he's fast enough just by hitting the Valkyrie. So Ryu feels safe here, actually contesting Bjergsen past the midway point. And that's bit, that was Ryu's thing at Worlds last year. He was constantly shoving up and applying pressure. And now it's kind of an obvious run, but Ryu's just going to make sure he's going to find that control ward. Zig again is going to take some damage here from Hansa. Who already backed, and now Hansa is really low on mana again. So he's not being very efficient. So Ryu went to go contest the pink ward, or the control ward. He cleared it out and used his package there. Just fine, getting a little bit of vision. Doesn't, you know, not a big roam, but not too troublesome. And Spence Garen pulls the tunnel out to safety. And if you're Spence Garen in this game, it's very hard to find a target that you can actually go on because this Shen is just going to use his ultimate to get down there. And then you have a numbers disadvantage because Hanser had to use the TP, of course, earlier. So you don't have a way to equalize the numbers if you do make a play. Now that the TP is coming back up for Hanser, we might be seeing a play come through. Shen's got Stench United as well, and Anori will sneak his way into the first brush, but not the second. Uh, by Adrian, had, Adrian has Sweeper, and he hasn't swept yet. So, yeah, now they know it's warded because of the fact that the minions went over there. But they are poking them out. This is... So Anori's just showing in this lane because they've been poking so much. There's no sustain for the Zyra. There's no potions that you can actually get control of the river. Bjergsen is roaming down right now. They know this. And this is, this is dangerous from Anori. He's picking up the honey fruit. But he knows to back off because the scuttle. Yeah, TSM have so much coverage in the river. Actually, three different wards. Oh, I guess two wards plus the scuttle. Making sure they have all that vision. Sven Skaren's going to take the rest of the fruit that Inori didn't want. And Bjergsen's going to return back to lane. Does land the poison onto Ryo. My is going to follow Ulti. He's going to force Ryu to Valk out of the way. Interesting that he would go for that. Ryu doesn't have Valkyrie. What is he doing? Oh, way too far, far forward. forward. Now Sven Skaren's going to gank him. He's going to flash, but Sven's going to follow. First blood goes to Rek'Sai. What was Ryu doing there? He's way too far forward. He's trying to get a ward in that right side bush, but he had just used Valkyrie. At that point, you just seed that. You just back up, and you just don't go for that. Well, he saw Sven Skaren, so a missed up there from Ryu. Could cost him it. Anori wants Bjergsen. He's going to try and isolate him, but Sven Skaren's still there. Stanch United is going to run him in, but they're going to go for it. They're going to try and kill him taunt. before he it completes it, but he can't. Miasma is causing problems, so Zig now going to have to run away. He's going to get knocked up as well. Torn through. There's the flash. Bjergsen flashes in, gets himself the kill. And that's two going over to Bjergsen. One kill, one assist with the help of Sven Skaren. That combo turned online, and that top lane turret is now taking a ton of damage because Zig had to go down there. Can't leave Jace alone with structures, that's for sure. Haunts are going to pull this wave away, let the Castle Creeps do some additional work, and we'll just watch this again. Inori, he really wanted it. Yeah, he knew that the ultimate was down from Bjergsen, but the fact that Inori wasn't able to stick to him, doesn't have boots yet, the Cassiopeia was able to just move away, throw down the Miasma, and Zig comes out. If Zig comes out and is able to get a taunt across two members, then he's in a really good spot, but the Miasma actually prevented that, and they weren't able to turn it around. Hansa also got that first turret gold, so a big surge of money into his pockets as he's finished a Black Cleaver, and that's the sort of CS lead we would expect in the matchup. Yep. Yes, Sig is going back to collect the waves, but free time for Hansa. Got him additional turret gold, got him a 30 CS lead, and he's finished his Black Cleaver. Bjergsen's already started to go off with help for Sven Skaren. Now the top lane's going off for TSM as well. Yep, and you would expect if that earlier play from Ryu, if maybe an ultimate from Shen had come out then, then that was the opportunity for them to wait for Inori to get there. But then they just trickle in, they do this... <laughs> the standard mistake that we see all the time. Uh, the guy doesn't have ultimate, let's try it. But the jungler is still there, still camping for him. Infernal Drake does go over to P1, so they get something back. But this almost 3,000 gold lead means that TSM, they get to take the blue. They get to do the classic TSM from last split, where they just go after the blue buff, 
after getting control of mid and the jungle. Yep, this is a control that they exerted time and time again in summer last year. Arrow's lining something up while totally in the chain of corruption and Ori's on top of him and that was a misstep. Doesn't even get a chance to flash there. So Wild Turtle gets killed. This gives pressure down to the bottom side. Ryu is now coming down here and looking for that blue buff or at least getting around the area because he knows that it's going to be up soon. Stealing TSM's plants, which doesn't feel great. Bergen's like, yep, got your blue buff. What do you want to do about it? Ryu's going to dodge out from the queue. That's a good start. Three-man push here for P1, though. Could get themselves their first out of turret. They won't get the bonus gold, but they'll be happy to take some gold away instead. Yeah, but they're camping Ryu in the mid lane. They know he doesn't have flash. Giving gold over. Zig now here as well. Turret damage. This Mass. can go down. Yeah, and this actually should, I think, with Haunter here. Extra armor's going to kick in. They needed to wait for another minion wave, so won't be able to take the turret, but great but. damage done to it. And Nori is going to steal away the blue, but Ryu's relatively far away, and I'm not sure he can get to it, so... Sure, they'll just trade blue buffs, but denying it from the mid lane is still a win for TSM. Yeah, both the experience and the fact that this is a Cassiopeia. He just needs that mana. We saw him almost go out of mana in the previous fight. The Lost Chapter kicks in and helps out a ton. And now they're going to go in for the turret, oh. and Briox is actually trying to zone him off no, with him, yeah. but he took the tower hits, cleanses out of the way, and Nori snared up on the other side, and TSM, a risky take, but they'll get the turret. P1 looking for something, but Arrow with no ulti just can't find the snipes. Bjergsen gets away by the skin of his teeth there. Just barely, the cleanse coming through as well, making sure that he's able to just slither off there, but that gives a little bit more control to the mid lane. Zig gets a little bit of a breather in the top side, and Hanser will pick up these minions that are in mid. Yeah, he's more than capable of defending any potential push, so TSM assigning the right people for the job here. Hanser is going to clear this out, then it'll scurry back to the top lane mm -hmm. to deal with Zig once again as Hanser continuing to hold a pretty good lead in CS. Yeah, and now that TSM have the top turret, lost the bottom turret, Looks like they're going to set up Wild Turtle in the mid lane here. Uh, to provide him a little bit more safety. He does need to farm a bit. He is down in CS. He is down in levels as well. It looks like Bjergsen will be on the side lane because it's hard to 1v1 that Cassiopeia with anybody that you have right now. But Trinity Force has been completed for Ryu. Yeah, going to move that coverage probably down to that right-hand side as well and make sure Bjergsen is safe without cleanse and flash. It. It's a little tricky to try and get away is Cassiopeia, but I kind of like the spirit of the play. TSM have actually created a situation where we're starting to see more and more with, you know, a tower going down in bot, and then the dual lane rotating to pick up safe farm in mid. The difference here is that TSM's aggression actually forced down the mid tower early, which means that one of these lanes is safe and one of them is unsafe. So Turtle has so much room to get free farm here, and every time P1 walks to mid to try and collect what should be easy farm, it's actually way less safe than it should be because the turret's gone. Yeah, they're actually not looking for a turret right now. They would most likely put Jace into the bottom lane if they were looking for that turret. But it's just safe farm, like you said. Bjergsen will pick up the wave on bottom. They don't have control of this jungle side yet. And so now, I actually think Phoenix 1 have a little bit more tempo here with bot and mid. And it, that That is so risky to do. Base oh. check. Oh, no. Oh, he's got him in there, well. too. That's going to be Bjergsen dead. The taunt lands in. My asthma not this time. Zig able to take him out. And you can see Bjergsen like, oh, man, I thought it was a safe area. That's the combo they're looking for. Inori with the ultimate comes out with the Shen. It's that extra surprise, the submarine coming through. Needed a bit more coverage, but there was even a control ward in that push that Bjergsen face checks. So smart setup there for P1. TSM don't kind of do their homework correctly, and we'll get the mid laner killed. However, Hornster and Biofrost are looking for a tier two turret, and the rest of TSM's coming through. Phoenix want to try and respond to this instead of pushing mid. Ryu's pushing bottom lane. Yeah, he's got the Trinity Force, so he does a lot of damage to these turrets. So he'll be able to pick this one up before there is an answer for it. So they will just equalize the turrets and they'll have to push in mid. So Phoenix won, once again, a little bit more tempo here. I actually think they're playing the map a little bit better. Good assignments here as Zig and Haunter are doing battle. Haunter out of mana, gonna have to leave the area. The rest of TSM will back off and try and defend this push. Yep. The P1 also had set up. TSM are cut off and Svenskaren might face check a couple P1 members. Ooh, what? Oh, Adrian was predicting the E, yeah. okay. Predicted the E instead of reactionary to when it starts. I think you, you have enough time to throw the bubble and catch them as soon as you see the tunnels start spawning. Instead, tries to get cute. That turns going pretty tanky. Likely relatively safe there as well. TSM will hold on to their mid lane out of turret for now. But Bjergsen has an even longer lane to try and get this farm in. So we'll see if TSM, they want to change up the lane assignments or if they're happy to kind of cover Bjergsen a bit better in that right hand side and make sure he doesn't get ganked again. The issue for TSM, though, is putting Bjergsen in that bottom lane means it's such a gigantic long lane that they're not really actually 
threatening that turret. Uh, and this is the, the side of the map, of course, where Drake comes up. So if they get shoved in, they'll lose Drake control. It's much easier for Phoenix 1 to start getting wards down here and down in the, uh, the blue buff area of TSM that they would be able to contest it and pick it up. TSM, you can see they've got a big open space, but trying to slowly navigate down towards this bottom lane. Okay. Get the wards down. And now they're posturing like they really want to take this turret and starting to get control of this area. Uh, and it's just awkward that Inori's on the top side of the map right now. Because Phoenix 1, Drake is about to come up. They're saying that this is Cloud Drake. They actually don't care about this Drake, that they're willing to sacrifice it to get a kill onto Haunter and also to get this turret if possible. We're going to try and take this one. Haunter, I think, knows what's up. Yeah. He's playing very far back. Because his team is on the other side of the map. It's the right play to make. And now you can see the pinging on the bottom. Ryu is backing off of the bottom turret because that's the counter play there is TSM would go three-man bottom. Now it's about who gets there faster, who gets the turret faster. They're seeing what is what are the bottom lanes doing, the bottom lane and support. They're just trying to trying to fight each other in mid. Yeah, TSM might have brought a few too many people to the bottom lane party because Arrow was actually continuing to push up and threaten that turret. Bjergsen and Sven I mean, should be able to finish this off. They're going to need another wave. Well, Zig has ultimate as well. So if Ryu is able to push them off, there is always the possibility of Zig ulting, and then they don't get anything out of this. But I think Bjergsen will continue to push. And because there isn't ward control on the bottom side, like we can look at it with God Vision and say, oh, there's only Sven Scaring there. But they don't really have a 100% idea of who's in this jungle on the bottom side for Ryu. They're actually dark, as you can see, all along this right-hand side. So I love that we did that. They'll leave TSM to go take the Drake. They were pings onto it. So this is kind of the natural play. TSM knew they had to plant a little further ahead, given how long the bottom lane was. But successfully take the Drake, they have to trade for it, which isn't ideal. But they're still up almost 2,000 gold. So they've got a lead. It's not a huge lead. But TSM will take in. Both teams have done a really good job, both uh, being proactive but also reacting to a lot of these mid-game macro situations. Yeah, they're actually playing very similarly in the terms of how they set up their movements and then the movements that they make. So you can tell that both of these teams are top of the half, top of the league, uh, because of the way that they're moving around the map. And it's just systematic. Oh, even when, uh, the, if we were to go back and look at how they were taking those outer turrets, the one P1 getting the top one, and TSM getting the bottom one with Bjergsen, the way that the mid uh, was going on in mid, the way that the bottom lanes were posturing, the supports and the AD carries were posturing towards their sides of the map, just barely, just barely. And it's enough to make it so like, okay, if something happens, we are ready to go. Ooh, well, Turtle looking for something. Edge of Night there night. as well. Really nice from yep. Turtle. Actually just decided not to shoot any more bullets. I think the team wasn't quite in range to follow up, but that's one of those things that we haven't really talked about yet on Jim. We know how good the lethality portion is, but the blocking CC part is yeah. pretty nice as well. Well, yeah, first time that I saw Edge of Night, I was like, oh, I'll try this item out. Uh, bottom on Misfortune, you pop it and then you pop the ultimate. You can't be stopped unless they throw two CC spells at you or a spell and a CC. It's so strong to actually just prevent people from interrupting your ultimate. Uh, and one of the counters to Jin, So it covers a weakness of his. And it's such an absurd item right now. Yeah, really strong. And good use of Turtle kind of showing it off. No pick for TSM in the mid lane. They are playing around kind of the one imbalance as far as uh, map control goes because they still have an outer turret for a little while longer. The longer they can protect that, the better because that's direct central control of the map. And you can see they're setting up a turtle, trying to find a pick around the area, because if they get something, they can translate straight to another objective. But they don't really have momentum in any of the lanes. Zig has momentum bottom. Ryu has a little pressure top past the halfway point. Inori. Not going to get caught. Blast Cone should save him if he needs it. He's going to just use it to yep. deny it from TSM and use the ulti to get out of the way. And Zig is now the huge problem exactly. in bottom. They saw all five, all five members there, so Zig will just push this down, get a little bit of damage on it. You know, he just nibbles at the turret, chips it a little bit. Swords aren't really effective against structures. <laughs> well, he's doing what he can. He wants to see it to clean up the mess, though. Tower not going to take too much damage and will regenerate over time. This also gives Zig oh. inside track to mid, so he could actually flank and come around if they did want to make a play. Phoenix 1 have a control ward right here on the right side of mid, so you have to abandon this if you're TSM, because you don't have the members who Pierce has to hold top. And when we talk about momentum, and I say, and I'm talking about wave pressure, it's because it's like Phoenix 1 have a wave slowly pushing top lane. They have one pushing bottom lane. You have to answer those waves, or that's just, that's just lost gold, which slowly gets tipped away. And so you have to give up that middle turret. Ooh, good poke! Top of the arrow. Gets chunked low, but ultimate not used there from Wild Turtle. Yeah, they have to get him back to healthy, because this is still the, the threat of a Baron on the table. Gonna chase down, but TSM just kind of have poke and don't have too much engage. I mean, no hard engage for a team, but plenty of yeah. long range engage for a pick. It's like catch, yeah. They can catch somebody out with Desira, with the Jin, and that's really what they're looking for. And that's why the map is so open, because the teams are just okay with giving up turrets 
uh, because they want a really big open map. They don't want a lot of places for you to hide. Uh, and they want a lot of fog of war so that they can pick people off. Yeah, and that imbalance has been corrected with P1, evening up the turret score now. You can see that gold still up by under a thousand or so for TSM, but this game is awfully close at 23 minutes in, and we've now corrected in some ways all the advantages that did exist before. I mean, it's one Drake apiece. Mm -hmm. You can argue that Infernal Drake's probably a bit better than Cloud Drake, especially as the game goes later. But we'll have another Drake in a little bit, and right now the teams are just setting up on what is a very scary open map. Yeah, and it's only about a 400 gold difference, and this is kind of the Jace tax, where he's up about 30 CS. Mid lane, though, even in CS, bottom lane, Wild Turtle is actually getting a little bit destroyed there with Arrow being over 10 per minute and the highest CS in the game at the moment on this Varus. I can't help but feel like some of these lane assignments maybe didn't work out the way they wanted to. Hornsa probably needed to be tagging Zeke in the 1v1 versus Shen. But P1 did a good job pressuring the correct side lanes and split pushing better. And that is the other thing to talk about. Sure, Rek'Sai is pretty mobile around the map with their ultimate, but it's nothing compared to the global presence of Stand United. Yeah. And there's just a lot of things here that P1 have going for them. Um, that cut off options from TSM and can make P1 a little bit braver, where they have the Shen ultimate that can always back them up from Zig. And Inori, second item, sometimes we see Black Cleaver, which used to be the, the hotness on Kha'Zix. Now we're seeing the Edge of Night second. He will pop it, he can sit and brush, he can actually open up on somebody like Bjergsen. Now Bjergsen has to E before he ultis to actually get the sun off instead of the knee-jerk reaction of ulting, which most people will have. So if he's able to just recognize that in that quarter second where and Ori opens up that he has the veil on him, then he'd be able to break it. But it takes a lot, a lot of training and a lot of presence of mind to do that. Yeah, I mean, he's got both the reactions and the knowledge to be able to do that. But I just love that Kaz kind of had his two items melded into one. Before, you know, as you said, Black Cleaver. Hex yeah. was usually the buy. Now just put them together in Edge of Night as Haunter and Zig doing battle, but that one wears off pretty quickly. Yeah. It makes him quite squishy because he doesn't have the HP. But I will say that you know, the CDR is missed. That hurts on the Wild Turtle. You can see both uh, these early lethality builds from AD carries. It's kind of all about who hits those skill shots. We heard at the top of the day that Arik is certainly known for his accuracy. It's not mm -hmm. a stat we can measure that accurately yet, but <laughs> he's such a strong player. Like, he's been known for his, uh, his Ash, his Varus, these types of champions already. He's very good at sniping on the utility it, camp. And that's one of the reasons like, I was so hyped for Arrow coming into the NALCS because the meta looked like it was going to suit him. Ash. Jin, great champions for him. Varus then pops through the meta, and once again, Arrow just having the accuracy, it blows me away. I would love to see an accuracy stat if we were ever to have one. Technology, one not day. quite there yet. One day. As both teams still jostling for position. Again, Goldie's very thin. And Ori gonna look to take this Drake away, so P1 actually getting ahead on Drake, kind of evening that particular one up between the sides. Spence Garing gonna steal another blue for TSM, and they're in position. To do something around Baron. Haunter is in bottom lane now, which I think makes sense, and Zig is going to join him in that 1v1. But again, with the map being nice and open, you have to stick together. Can't afford to get picked off or blown up, but you also have to manage the map correctly and not give away a big objective. We're going to get towards Elder, and even the next Mountain Drake will be important. And of course, Baron is always on the table as that big objective that every team wants at this point. And this is the type of game that you would expect from teams that are jockeying for second place. And Phoenix won. I mean, they are a far cry from the beginning of the summer split Phoenix one where they were jumbling their roster around trying to figure out, oh, how can we get a lot of these guys into the country? Now, Phoenix one, I know the organization has invested so much into them. Translator, having Fly come in as the coach, having imports, constantly just trying to upgrade. And they are very, very invested in this team being a top of the table team. And it makes sense, you, you know, the boot camp they did in Korea before the mm -hmm. season started, getting the roster together early, getting everyone practicing together early, building synergy, getting all their players in the country like early on, doing all that legwork first. Like you're right, the investment in the organization behind the scenes has been huge for this team. And it makes sense. We saw in week one, if you think back, a couple weeks now, how every team just looked a little scattered, TSM included. P1 have looked consistent from the get-go, and you can tell the investment's paying off. Yeah, very, very invested. P1 mean business, and they want to be able to take down TSM, prove that they themselves are giants like we had said earlier. Ow. Well, and that's the poke right there. Just does so much damage, and it made us a little bit surprised in Champions like that the Varus wasn't picked up, but we'll see. Try to go on oh, Hurdle! Hurdle for a play! Little caught out, and Ori able to get it, flashes for the kill. And now it's 4v5 in favor of P1. And Turtle cannot catch a break. He can't farm these waves safely at all. And Nori comes in from the right. Ryu straight down, straight up the gut. They're going to get this turret with the Trinity Force. Yeah, this is now a little opening created. Once again, we have 
some uneven objectives here as Svenskeren trying something. Now, they're actually stopping Jace from backing. Here comes Inori down to the bottom lane. He's going to try to punish Hanser, and Zig is here as well. So can his HP hold out? I don't know. Zig's still tanking. Hanser, yeah, he can't do it. Not enough. Inori, just another easy kill. That's big momentum there for Phoenix One. Now they have that Tier 2 down in the mid lane. They have the Tier 2 down in bottom lane. They can start making plays for that top side of the map, which is where they want to be in the first place with having that Baron. Still a gradual increase, though. 1,500 gold ahead for P1. They couldn't convert a big enough fight to try and take an objective. So instead, they'll take their extra gold. They'll take their extra turret. Turtle will go to now the next safe spot on the map as this top wave is pushing towards the Tier 2 turret. But TSM, they'll cut their losses. They'll say they didn't get Baron. That's the big thing that the teams are looking for as we approach the 30-minute mark. And Teams are still getting stronger and stronger. I mean, you can tell that both these teams are well practiced in uh, moving around the map together, and they know that as it gets later, the fights and the margins you can win or lose by increase, or I guess narrow by the, in that sense. Your margin of error becomes mm. smaller. You can't Thank make you. any mistakes. Can't make too many. This stuff there from TSM is going to cost them a couple. Can't make any pastry. Not too bad. <laughs> well, all right. Here's uh, the Baron from P1. Got rid of the Blast Cone. Rek'Sai on the opposite side of the map. Tunnel, closest one is right there. Doesn't take long. Arrow, though, in there. And the damage is huge from everyone. Svenskeren, he does have the opportunity Good. to get in. Good, Strangle going to go in for it. He's going to try and get some kills, but he doesn't have enough. He's dead instantly. And a Haunts going to try and snipe it off P1. They get the Baron, but can they get out? Bjergsen going to try it tied up. A Nori tag by the Rylai's Q from Cassio. But P1, they just feel confident now. Turtle going to open up. He tags Adrian. There's Zig tanking the shots. Fourth one oh. coming. Shockblast almost gets him. Strangle Thorns is there. Oh, Nori's going around the turtle. The snipe, and now Inori look for another assassination. The flank is good. Inori makes the play against the double Haunter. Now getting torn apart as a stage. Now keeps him alive. Bjergsen going to try and make it happen, but looks to be the Quadra. Not quite, but that's an ace for V1. And P1 take over the game. They have all five members up, up and TSM are down. They're going to start shoving these waves. Caught slipping, those recall timers cost TSM any advantage around the Baron area. And now Shen's pushing bottom side, Zig's gonna stay there. P1's gonna shove two different lanes and try and knock down some turrets. And P1 just seemed to understand wave manipulation and what it makes your opponent do. Zig made the bottom wave come out to him, so Hanser wanted to shove it a little bit harder. And he played as if, okay, you know what? We're not that, I'm not that safe. And then Inori came down, got that. Hanser's back in the base. Then they start making a play for Baron. Svenskeren has to come back, and he's not able to get it away. Ryu actually covers the smite with that last 50 damage. I mean, even then, Sven died before he could even try and smite it, so watch yep. this one again. He goes and in at 3,000 health. Well, he doesn't really have vision of it, the control wards. And he, that's the point where you're just like, all right, are they either going to keep hitting it? I have about, you know, 3,000 health. <laughs> that's DPS that I can take off also buys time for them to get in here. But Inori going all the way around. He already prepares the veil as he's walking with the Edge of Night, jumps over. Bjergsen actually gets hit as he goes over, takes a ton of damage, and now he's basically out of the fight too. Bjergsen wanted to re-engage that because he still had ultimate. Bjergsen wanted to make a play where he blast cone, ultis, and gets multiple people, but I think he got hit by an arrow right before he got over the, with the blast cone. Yeah, play does not work out there, and P1 win a pretty convincing team fight around the Baron and break in two crucial places. We've been talking so much about these teams and their macro game. And the thing about playing the map like this is mid lane inhibitor, usually not that bad if it's the only one you lose, but losing a side lane creates such a big map imbalance. Yeah. TSM gonna try and make it up here with this play, but Inori's on the back again. Oh, what? Goodbye, Biofrost! As Turtle's dead as well, and Ori 1v2 for another double. Might make it a couple there for Sven as he goes down, and Bjergsen, he's gonna try oh, to He jumps over the ultimate, outplays Bjergsen, there's the taunt, and P1 just have it all. They just slaughtered TSM. They're gonna take this turret, they have the Baron. They're gonna end the game here, Pastry. I mean, the minions are there, they're gonna try and just run in for it. Zig gonna tank up the shots. P1, not interested in the last inhibitor, they're gonna claim the game instead. Nexus turret demolished by the super minions, and Phoenix 1 clean up TSM in game number one. As clean as it gets, Inori, 7-0-6 on the Kha'Zix. Great positioning, 100% kill participation at the end. And a delicate game for a long time now. It felt like back and forth for 20, 25 minutes, we were talking about what was happening, how both teams were playing it so close. Usually in tense games like that, you have one defining moment that opens up the game. It was that Baron. And it wasn't like TSM went in for a 50-50 and tried to make a risky play. P1 made the standard Baron call, took the Baron because TSM were not in position, and won the ensuing team fight, which is the one place you think they might fall down to.
That's literally everything right. Yep. Like, the only thing in that P1 really did wrong that game was that mid lane skirmish that cost Ryu and Zig their lives because Ryu, you know, he went up after he had used his Valkyrie, he got caught. And then Zig came in to help Inori, saves Inori, but those are the two kills that TSM got in the entire game. And then Phoenix 1 were able to get two back, and then they won the next few team fights and got the next few picks that ended up winning them the game. And it did seem like TSM, their aggression is still there, which is nice for them, but they just kind of couldn't get the rest of it going. They broke mid, and I thought, okay, we've seen them play aggressive like this in summer last year. Maybe they can snowball the, the map advantage, but P1 just kept very calm, traded intelligently, and then continued to play the map a bit better. Yeah, and that's the thing is shot calling. I mean, it's kind of a... Uh, a dead horse at this point, but you know we talked about Double If leaving the roster, and now Bjergsen has to focus on who's picking up those side waves. Am I picking up the side waves? Who's actually going to collapse? Because that felt like TSM. They had momentum a few times, they had advantages, but then they never actually did anything with them. They waited for a point where Phoenix One go, oh, Turtles out of position, time to catch him. Yeah, and right? it, that was a good catch. It caught, caught the recalls, and it actually led to the replay that we're going to have a look at. That big brand fight that really just defined the game. Yep. I mean, TSM are already not in position, and Sven, he just has to go in blind. Now, the TP has to come through, Sven Skarin has to come through as well with Patrol Ward down on his own. And Adrian actually flashes out there of the redemption too. Arrow has heal, so he's still safe. And this, like Bjergsen now is going around to try and make a play. And see there, he ate one arrow. Now, let's see what hits him again here. Because he's going to go over. Yeah, he actually did get hit there by another. And Inori whew, goes over for Turtle. Big pickup there. And then the triple for himself. And he didn't even want it. He's like, this scuttle crab is worth more than <laughs> He's like, let's go. Like, there's no, there's zero reason to actually attack the scuttle crab That's there, true. except BM. And you can see the game here, very close for a little while. Kind of back and forth as TSM had a slim lead kind of what? moving in. And then just look at the snowball. That's the game ending in, I don't know what, Five-ish minutes, maybe seven, my math's all. Yeah, that's that's literally P1 has two kills. They get a catch on Turtle, leads to the Baron, then they win next two team fights, and that's those 13 kills after they had picked up two at the beginning. So look at that damage though. Kha'Zix damage being 19k, 100 behind a Varus that is poking the whole time. Sure, the Kha'Zix has the Evolved W and the Spike Racks, and he's able to just, you know, poke a little bit, but it's not on that level. It's not that absurd. That's a Nori getting in there and getting in the thick of the fight. He's out damaging a Quirky. And you can see why they picked the Kha'Zix so early in that game. He went off in every team fight. They only needed two-ish <laughs> to really make anything happen in the game, but that's all the work that he did. Yeah, a Nori, and I think that also, like, the entire team composition... Uh, allowed him to thrive because he could make those daring plays with the Shen backing him up, picks up the edge of night, and then he's able to just dive in. And I think that Inori, he's establishing himself a little bit as the kryptonite of TSM. Maybe. A very clean game there for P1. We are going to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll see if TSM can bounce back in game two. Don't touch the browser. You're watching the